Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Reiner. I am a communications coordinator contract with South Dakota Specialty Producers. I want to thank you for joining our event on raising sheep and goats. Um, here with me is Kelly, our special guest. Um, and this segment is funded by a project we have with Natural Resource Conservation Service, NRCS. Um, to help promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. So thank you so much for um, dedicating your time to speak with me today, Kelly. Um, can you kind of tell me a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah. Um, so like you mentioned, so I'm Kelly Froelich. So I work for South Dakota State University. I am the small ruminant extension specialist. So my job is kind of split three ways. I teach sheep production in the fall, um, but I also do a little bit of research and the majority of my appointment is extension. So doing things like this, going to visit producers, helping them out. That's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. So, so you're an, an important point of contact if anybody yes. has questions or, or needs resources. Um, can you kind of explain how you got into this field and why you chose to do the work you do? Yeah, so um, I mean, I guess I kind of started out in the sheep industry. So um, that is my background. Sorry, go people. Um, <laughs> but so I started raising sheep when I was about uh, 13. I had um, family members in Iowa that had sheep. So that's how I got my interest in sheep. Um, I still have a flock of sheep at my parents' house in Minnesota that they take care of when I'm at my day-to-day -day job. Um, so, I mean, that's kind of really where my interest came with like the small ruminant aspect. Um, I had a lot of friends who had goats growing up too, so um, kind of have a familiarity with them too. Um, when I went to college, you know, I got involved in undergrad research, you know, and really loved it. Um, so just kind of kept going with my education and this job opened up when I finished my PhD. So I applied for it and got it and that's kind of how I got here. So yeah, but just kind of get to do what I love every day. That's the best feeling. And, yes. and knowing that the work you do is rewarding and important. Um, for just keeping our environment as fertile and healthy as we can. Yeah. Um, so a few things are needed information-wise before somebody starts raising sheep or goats. Um, can you kind of share um, maybe what's needed in the beginning process and, and what people should be thinking about when they wanna embark on this journey? Right, um, so, I mean, I guess, I can kind of relate to my own experience, you know, starting sheep. Um, I got, like I said, my first sheep when I was 13 um, and I made a lot of mistakes. So I always encourage producers, you know, if you want to get into sheep or goats, that's great. Um, but try to like connect with, you know, other people in the area and learn about some of the challenges and also some of the things that they may be, you know, did really well on, right? Because every area in the country is a little bit different on how they raise their sheep or goats. Um, and your fellow producers can be a, a valuable, you know, wealth of information. So it's really good to kind of get connected to the industry, you know, and just learn about, you know, the strengths and challenges in your area. Um, and then they can serve as a mentor too. So when you have issues, which, you know, we don't ever want, but they do pop up, you know, you have somebody you can call and be like, hey, I need help, right? So that's kind of where I always encourage, you know, people to start off with. Um, and then also to, you know, reach out to your local extension um, people too, you know, um, if they don't have the answers, they often have the networks and stuff and they connect, can connect you to the people um, that can get you the right resources, so. It, it's a very nice um, just resource for anybody who wants to start, especially for crabs or, you know, grain, any, any kind of thing. Um, I am not a producer myself, but I, I live in Sioux Falls and I'm very passionate about urban agriculture. And mm -hmm. I would love to one day, you know, have the dream acreage, all that stuff. So um, I am taking steps to educate myself more about what's needed and, and that, and, you know, having a goat or a sheep since you're 13 that's like that's like a, a family <laughs> pet to you you know it's like raising dogs so 
Um, in our area, what are the typical kind of sheep that that would benefit from our environment? Right. Um, you know, there's a lot of different breeds, you know, in the state of South Dakota. Um, you know, you go out west, a lot of your western range type breeds of sheep um, are kind of like a Rambouillet, Targhee influence. Um, on the eastern part, you probably see more diversity in breeds. Um, so for as far as sheep, like, you know, you have a lot of the show people, so you're kind of blackface, like your Suffolk camps. Um, South Downs can be really popular, but you also get some of the larger farm flocks, I would, or commercial operations that probably have like a polypay influence. Um, on the goat side, you know, it's maybe a little bit, it's a smaller industry in South Dakota, but it is growing. Um, and you get a lot of variability, you know, in breeds there too. So like when you talk about like, uh, meat goats, like your boar goats. Um, there's a lot of different, you know, kind of uh, dairy goats like La Mancha um, or just, you know, a mix of different things like um, Spanish, Alpine. There's all sorts of different breeds that people have. So, I mean, it's hard to say like what's the top breed, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, South Dakota is pretty diverse. Um, if you haven't, you know, had an opportunity to travel across the state, you can even see that in the environment, right? So you cross the river, you know, west side is very different from the east side. Um, so that kind of influences a little bit on the different breeds. And as you go out throughout the United States, you know, the differences in breeds, you know, and the type of breeds people raise vary quite a bit as well. So I think that's, that's so cool is, is, you know, I'm, I'm in Sioux Falls. I've been on this side of the state most of my life, but ever, anytime I want to just like get away, I'm like, oh, I'm just going to go to the other side of the state. Um, mm -hmm. It's a different environment completely. And so mm -hmm. um, I know that, that goats and sheep are great for grazing. They're great for naturally cleaning up um, foliage and stuff. So what kind of fencing or um, steps do you need, do you need to take to kind of keep them safe or keep them in certain pastures that you choose? Right. Um, and this can be a little bit of a tricky question to answer. Um, I would say it depends a lot on the temperament of your breed, right? Um, you know, there's kind of a joke in the goat in world, you know, if you can take a bucket of water and throw it through the fence, the goats can get out. <laughs> um, <laughs> because <laughs> they're very well known for escaping, but that can also be your, you know, certain breeds of sheep too. Um, so typically, you know, like a fence, you know, we say it needs to be about 39 inches tall, right? Um, if you have sheep or goats that are a little more jumpier than that, you might need something a little bit more rigorous, um, but hopefully you can get them to kind of train and respect the fence. That's the goal, right? Um, so a lot of producers, you know, especially in this part of the um, state, you know, will do like woven wire um, that can be pretty great at keeping sheep or goats in um, the caveat with goats if they have horns they can if they stick their head through there they can get stuck if you know, especially if they have horns. Um, so the smaller squares can be better but obviously that's going to increase the expense right. Um, Barbed wire, it's not, you know, out west it probably is more commonly used than on the eastern part of um, the state. Um, it can, it can work usually like they say about six strands, you know, with the bottom wires closer together and then you can space them out a little bit further when you, um, the higher up you get, right? It's not the best, like if you're focusing on like, um, a wool breed, you know, if they're rubbing against the fence, it can catch the wool and kind of diminish wool quality a little bit, if that's something that you're interested or concerned about. Um, but I wouldn't say it's barbed wire is as common, but you can keep them back with electric wire too. And again, you're probably going to have to have several strands. And the main thing to note about electric fences is that you need to make sure it's hot, right? Um, if it's not shocking, you will have sheep and goats out. Um, and a little note on sheep, 
So if they have a full fleece on them and they're not trained to electric fence and they can get their like head through there and they don't get a shock, like the wool axe is an insulator. So they will get out too. So if you're, you know, if you get cheaper goats, you know, the main thing is to make sure that when you're training them to the fence that, you know, the electric fence is hot, you know, has good voltage on it, you know, that they're going to get a shock, you know, on their nose or ears or something. So they're not going to be attempted to push through. So um, that's, <laughs> I don't know if that's a good answer, but yeah, they can be a little bit tricky sometimes to keep in. <laughs> I, I think it's a very realistic answer and a thing that people really need to plan for, you know, if you're going to have hordes of animals you have to make sure to contain them and keep them safe and so um I think this is a very important topic so I want to thank you for that answer because right. um this is something people might not think about when starting out and, right. and it's like do I take the extra expense and make sure I have a good quality fence or do I just kind of rough it and and try to trade them more I mean there's always going to be that one animal that's just mm -hmm. challenged or determined right well, and this is another note, if you're getting into the industry and you're getting your animals from like a known producer, make sure they're not selling you the animals that always get out because those are the animals that will, no matter what, will cause you trouble. <laughs> it seems like once they learn that they can get out, they'll always be testing it, so. <laughs> they're smart in that way. And, and yeah. that's, a, that's a really great point because I never would have thought of that. Um, so yeah, start with easy, manageable <laughs> blocks <laughs> that are, are not going to make you want to pull your hair out completely, right? Because I mean, right. animals. Um, so are there any other tips you have for producers um, or resources that you normally share in your daily work? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like I said, if you can contact with, you know, local producers, I find that always valuable just to learn what works for them, what hasn't worked, you know, because environment wise, it's so different when you go across the United States, um, even in South Dakota. So like, if you can find those local producers, I feel like they can be valuable mentor and support. Um, but then also, you know, extension um, can be really valuable. And then connecting with like your um, local breed associations, right? So for South Dakota, for sheep, we have the South Dakota Sheep Growers. Um, for goats, there's the Dakota Goat Association. They can be a valuable um, place to just, you know, make that network for connecting to local producers. Um, but they both also put on, you know, educational events and stuff that you can kind of learn and grow um, as you're getting started too. That's amazing. I, I'm just like, oh, maybe we could have sheep and goats, you know, uh, but I think to be realistic about what it really takes to take care of them, can you kind of give us an idea of what a day of goat and sheep chores might look like to somebody who is not familiar? Yeah, so uh, I mean, again, um, it's going to depend a little bit on your production system and what you're focusing on. Um, so like this time of the year, like if you're not, if you have the land and stuff, a lot of people have their sheep or goats on pasture or range land. Um, so your day-to-day -day care might be, you know, going out, checking to make sure everybody's okay, making sure that they have, you know, water, nothing's wrong with, you know, that. Um, and then, you know, maybe moving them, um, depending on if you're on a rotational system or what have you. Um, going into winter, obviously, that's going to be a lot different, you know, because you're going to have to be feeding them potentially grain or hay, um, or if you're a operation where you're strictly indoors, obviously, then you're going to have the daily chores of feeding them, you know, their hay and grain or whatever else that you're uh, feeding them. So, you know, it kind of, it, it depends a little bit on what your focus is, you know, and what resources um, you have available to you. So, but. I, I know that um, kind of speaking to the rotational routines people have, um, can you explain how goats and sheep are really beneficial for like the ground and replenishing in that way? Yeah, so, I mean, they're pretty good um, just in the standpoint, like they're lighter weight than cattle, so you don't get the soil compaction. And if you're 
um, managing the pastures well. So let's say like not overgrazing, you know, they can be very beneficial in helping, you know, like native species and stuff flourish, right? Because they're kind of, they're, you know, eating off the grass. And as long as you're not overgrazing it, you know, it's doing benefit to the grass by, you know, removing it and promoting that growth, but then they're also kind of a natural fertilizer, right? So as they're going about, they're spreading their manure, um, you know, and that is beneficial for the soil organic manner and putting some nutrients back into the land as well. So, you know, they can be very beneficial in just helping, you know, regenerate you know, a, a pastor or, you know, a field, if it's been kind of overworked, you know, it's going to be slow because anything with like soil health or anything to improve it is going to be slow progress. But as long as you're managing it well, you know, and you're not abusing it by overgrazing, they can help, you know, promote that soil health, you know, the plant productivity um, and that sort of thing. I, I, I've done a few farm tours and I think it's just so neat how you know it's it's not just one section of livestock or, or growing you know it's cover crops mm -hmm. it's rotational it's all regenerative egg that has to come together and so um, yep. they do play a really important role in naturally restoring elements so that's right cool. right um but uh what also comes with raising sheep and goats is illness and sickness and and mm -hmm. what to do if if they are, you know, ill or what kind of symptoms to look for, can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah. So I guess the first thing that kind of jumps into my mind um, when you talk about that, since we were just kind of talking about pastors, is parasites. Parasites can be a huge problem in the small ruminant um, industry. So, and Again, this kind of comes back a little bit to your pasture management um, because most parasites are within that like first three inches of grass. So if you're not grazing below that, you can help mitigate a little bit of those issues, you know, and if you're rotationally grazing them, um, giving that pasture a rest, you know, potentially you're also allowing time for those eggs and stuff to die out. Um, but parasites are a huge, huge issue in the industry. Um, we don't have a lot of approved dewormers for sheep or goats. Goats, it's even less. Um, and the dewormers we've had, they've been around for years and we're seeing a lot of resistance to it. So it's definitely something as a producer, um, if you're gonna raise sheep or goats um, to be aware of and try to, I guess, practice the you know best management practices so you can you know minimize the amount of resistance that you are creating in your flock or herd. Um, a really good resource is wormex.com, I think it is. Um, so, you know, that has a lot of different information on parasites, um, but it's also good to, you know, be talking with your vet, right? And I know this becomes a little bit of a touchy subject because, you know, a lot of, I talk to a lot of people and I'm like, well, we just can't find a good small ruminant vet. Um, but a vet is very essential if you're going to raise any sort of livestock. Um, if you, this last, well, this year um, in January, you know, there's been some new rules uh, proposed and basically we can't get any antibiotics over the counter anymore. Um, like we used to, like you used to go to runnings or fleet farm and be able to pick up a bottle of penicillin. You can't do that without your vet now. Um, so it's very important to have that, um, you know, um, producer vet client re relationship you know, and just have a conversation with them, you know, talk through your practices, you know, and then also if you get a sick sheep where you're in a need of requiring to give them antibiotics and stuff, you can, you know, call your vet up and be like, hey, you know, I'm having this problem um, and be able to get the help and resources you need. So I really, really encourage, you know, anybody who's getting in there is find a vet, you know, talk with them, you know, and treat them well too, right? Yeah. They're busy people. Um, they have a lot going on, you know, and if you're supporting them and using them, you know, they're going to be a lot um, more on your side than if you're just like, you only go to them when they have, you have problems, right? <laughs> so um, it's good to just develop a good relationship with them. And then I, oh, go, no, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. 
Oh, the last thing that popped into my head when we talk about like vaccines for sheep or goats, the one that we always say is like the gold standard is giving a CD and T shot, right? So C and D is just standing for clostridium type C and D. Um, so this is, it's especially it happens like or affects like younger um, animals, but it's a clostridium. It's a bacteria that can infect the gut um, and just cause, you know, like one of them, we call it overeating disease. Like if they overeat on grain or whatever, causes a proliferation in the bacteria and can kill animals quite quickly. So if you're going to give any sort of vaccine, like your CD&T um, is really good. The T in the CD&T is just stands for tetanus. Um, so especially for your younger animals during uh, castration or if you're banding tails or anything like that helps prevent them against there. And especially if you're, they're out in pasture and you have anything out there that they can cut themselves on, you know, it's a good thing to have protection against uh, tetanus. So very important knowledge, very important. Yes. And, um, you mentioned, is it kind of hard to find a vet? Um, are we low on, on service? So, <laughs> um, because I know, I know just to call to get my dog in, I have to wait about a month. So if anything emergency right. wise happens. You know. Right. Well, I mean, Vets can, you know, like we do have a shortage of vets in this country, but then especially on the small ruminant side, you know, you can maybe find a vet, but they're cattle vets, you know, or, you know, more of the larger animals. Um, sheep and goats are considered a minor species. So a lot of the common like drugs that we'll use in sheep and goats um, are extra label, meaning that they're not labeled for sheep and goats just because, you know, they're minor species and it it's not cost effective for drug companies to go through the trials and stuff to get, you know, goats and sheep on the label, if that makes sense. Um, so like that can be a challenge. Um, but then again, like when I was saying, like, reach out to your other producers in your area, they can be really helpful in sourcing, you know, those vets that are willing to work with small ruminants, because not all vets, you know, like want to even mess with sheep or goats. Um, so, you know, if you can kind of find the in, you know, um, with other producers in your area, who they use, you know, that can be a good way to kind of source different um, resources and help. So, yeah, it seems really beneficial of, of, hey, maybe I could save a trip to the vet if I just call my circle and see um, if anybody else is out with this. Right. Are there things that producers need to worry about when adding new um, sheep or goats to their current flocks? Yeah, so I would always be, um, I guess, a wary, you know, whenever you add in anything new, because you're opening the chance, you know, to have like, you know, any sort of, if they have any sort of disease or, you know, something with them, or, you know, just different, um, oh, how do I want to word this? Like they're used to different things. They can bring something into your flock or herd, you know, that hasn't been introduced and that can cause issues. Um, so I always encourage, like, if you're going to bring in new sheep or goats to an existing, you know, herd or flock, um, is to quarantine those new animals, you know, for a few weeks and just to make sure that nothing pops up, you know, they don't fall ill, you know, they're not bringing anything in there um, that can potentially, you know, affect your uh, sheep or, you know, goats. Um, the other thing I always encourage whenever you bring in new animals, because we talked a little bit about parasites and how that can be a huge um, issue, um, is while they're quarantined, I would treat them with dewormer, right? And I would actually treat them with a couple different dewormers. So let's say like, um, if it's a sheep, like ivermectin and velbazin. So you don't want to combine the two together, but you can give the ivermectin and then like the velbazin, you know, one after another. And all this does is ensures that it cleans that animal out of any parasites that they may have. So if you're buying that sheep or goat from an existing flock that potentially has any resistant parasites, hopefully you're cleaning that out and then you're not introducing that to your herd because the last thing you want is to develop resistance to any of your dewormers. 
that is that is a really good point and it's such a smart move because it's preventative care why why take the risk when you can just boom 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 right all nicely and and to just save the rest of your flock from any kind of illness or sickness um so let's flip sides now if somebody was interested in selling um you know Mm -hmm. sheep or goats what would that kind of look like is there you know some red tape they need to apply for are there certain industry um expectations to follow yeah so i mean i guess the first thing is um depends on if you're selling in state or with you know out of state so let's say if you're going to a show and sale right so the first thing um usually to cross state lines you're going to need like a vet um, health certificate um, you're also going to need to make sure that they have a scrapey take. Um, so you can sign up uh, with your, uh, shoot, um, USDA, I'm trying to think of the uh, farm service agency, I think it is, that um, kind of carries them, you know, and basically all it is, scrapey is a gender generative, like, um, disease that kind of affects the brain. Um, so we've been slowly eradicating it out of the United States and we don't have as many incidents of scrapie as we used to. Um, but it's something that it basically, it just puts, you know, a tag in the um, sheep's ear that has a number that is specific to the animal. And then it also has a number on top that it can link um, that animal to your farm in case of an outbreak, right? So that is, you know, a requirement. So if you're going to any show, you know, auction barn, you know, any show or sale, like they're going to have to have that uh, scrapey tag in them. If you're going to sell to an auction barn um, and they don't have a scrapey tag, oftentimes, you know, they'll charge you for the tags and it's going to be more expensive um, than, you know, if you were just to do it yourself. So very interesting they're not just like no sale they're like we will provide this service but also yeah. we need to locate where you are yeah. um that's great do you have any experiences um that you'd like to share of like hey what could maybe go wrong or something somebody might not think of while they're on their way to the sale barn right um well I guess you know just making sure you're practicing like safe handling you know um, you know, making sure like if it's a really hot day, you know, and they're in a trailer that you're always moving, or if you have to stop that, you know, they can get water, um, you know, especially this week, it's really hot. So, you know, heat stress, it it is a thing, you know, and it can happen on trailers. Um, so like just depending on where you're going, you know, just being aware of those things, um, trying to think what else, um, you know, making sure that they have the scrapey tags on them. Um, I, I think I have a good question here. So, um, let's talk about shearing. When would you, um, when would you plan to shear or when is it like you waited way too long? You need to do this now. Right. So, okay. Moat, like all breeds of sheep, well, I shouldn't say all breeds. There are some hair breeds, um, but all wool breeds of sheep you know at a minimum they need to be sheared once a year right um so very typically it's most people will shear like in the springtime um and this you know is kind of before the summer heat um you do have to be a little bit wary like if you shear your sheep and you stick them outside like on a day like today that they can get sunburnt and it's not gonna you know necessarily hurt them, hurt them, you know, but like we've all gotten some burns. It doesn't feel nice. So it is something to be kind of um, aware of. Um, But then also too, like if you have a sheep that let's say hasn't been shorn for two years, you know, and you're going into a week like this, they're going to be really miserable. I mean, wool can act as an insulator against heat and cold, but you know, once it gets to a really long length, you know, those sheep are going to be more prone to heat stress. So it's good to kind of get that wool off them. Um, You know, you do have to be a little bit careful shearing sheep, like let's say in the middle of the winter, Um, you can do it. 
but you just have to be aware of that, you know, those sheep aren't going to be in the middle of a blizzard with no shelter, right? Um, because they can succumb to hypothermia, right? Just like humans. Um, and if you do shear them, because it is pretty common practice, especially, you know, producers that are like, you know, let's say lambing indoors in January, February, they'll shear the ewes um, before lambing, um, which is a really good practice just to make sure that the ewe doesn't have all that fleece on them. You know, they're less likely to lamb the lambs. Um, you know, the lambs can find the teats easier, um, that sort of thing. But those ewes will require more energy to keep warm, right? Mm -hmm. So um, just kind of depends a little bit on your production system. Um, I'm, I'm glad that you brought up structures because what, what to you would be a good quality structure year long in South Dakota that can withstand winter? Um, right. What does that kind of look like? Right. Well, I'll kind of use the answer. It depends again, um, because, you know, you go out Western South Dakota, you know, they might not necessarily have, you know, a barn, you know, pole barn or wood barn or something to get their sheep in. Um, but, you know, they'll have like windbreaks or something like that, that can act as a shelter, you know, for them to get out of the wind, right? Um, so that's an important thing, like, you know, sheep and goats, you know, they're pretty tough, right? They can stand a lot. Um, but, you know, at a bare minimum, when we talk about shelter, you know, if it's really, really cold, bad weather, you know, getting them out of the wind, that's going to help a lot, right? Um, you get to this part of the state, you know, a lot of people will have wood barns or pole barns, um, something like that, you know, that they can get the sheep in, which is great. Um, the main thing that I see people kind of struggling with, especially if they're lambing, um, you know, we'll get a snap of cold weather or a blizzard. And the first thing people tend to do is button up all the barns, right? Um, this can be good um, to help keep it warmer. But a lot of times the ventilation isn't quite adequate, adequate. So then you get a lot of ammonia issues. So it's, you know, especially for the younger livestock, I would say colder is better than it being warmer as long as you don't have like the drafts because it's the drafts that, you know, causes, you know, the hypothermia issues. Um, but if you have a barn where you button it all up and it's raining moisture just because, you know, you don't have that ventilation to take out that moisture, you know, that can lead to some ammonia issues in those animals. Thank you for sharing. That's very important. Um, mm -hmm. And kind of goats, I mean, sheep and goats are very, like you said, resilient, but these, these environments can be a little bit too much to handle. Um, I just want to thank you for your knowledge today and um, just reiterate how beneficial this is to somebody who who might not know who's interested or who wants to mm -hmm. start and and as you've said a few times it seems like the most important resource is our community and mm -hmm. um, other local producers who are doing the work that we hope to do right um right. I I kind of want to pick your brain since you you um you've had sheep almost as long as I've had dogs <laughs> um, do you have you know, a favorite breed or any kind of favorite um, activities that you just really enjoyed growing up that helped you, you know, determine that this is the path you want to be in for your career? Right. Um, so, I mean, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about the type of breed of sheep I have, because I'm a little bit biased because, I mean, I have them because I like them. So I have uh, Lincoln long wolves. They're an old English breed, so not very common. Right. Um, but we do a lot of like niche marketing of the wool. Um, so I, we go to a few like sheep and wool festivals and I always find that fun. Um, so that kind of like always energizes me, you know, um, just to go there and see like people are really creative in what they can do with wool. Um, the second thing is, you know, uh, growing up, you know, I was able to go to like the county fairs and the Minnesota State Fair and showing like FFA shows and stuff. And I always really enjoyed that too, because it's a chance that you can showcase your animals, but then also you get a visit with other producers, right? Um, you know, and it's just kind of a nice little like social get together and get to talk about sheep. So um, 
I always, you know, like that, but I guess I'm, yeah, my bias is, you know, I love my Lincolns. So um, I would say that they're probably my favorite breed just because I raise them and had them for a long time. So, <laughs> but, you know, it's the breed that I have isn't going to be for everybody, right? Um, the thing that I can say about anybody getting into the industry is, you know, decide what you want to do, right? Um, is it, do you want to focus on meat? Do you want to focus on fiber? So on the sheep, on the wool side, I um, mean, in, in goats, there's Angora uh, fiber, you know, like what is it that you want to do and what makes you really passionate, right? Um, do you want to focus on the show side? Is that your kind of cup of tea? You know, um, just kind of, that will help you really decide what kind of breed of sheep that you would like. Um, if you can answer those questions, you know, and what you kind of want to do with your animals. It's, it's seems so simple, but like starting out, somebody might be like, oh, I'm just going to go get goats. But it's like, why are you getting goats? <laughs> right? right? Why are you getting sheep? Um, right. That's really important. And so well, kind of when you were talking about um, the creative ways people have used wool, do you have one that's most been like, wow, that's, that's ingenious. Um, well, I guess, so like the breed I have, they have, it's really coarse wool, but it's really curly. Um, so like our white sheep, um, I had a lady who was buying fleece from us to make life-size Santas. I don't know if it's like really cool, but it was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I don't know that I would be a person to buy a life-size Santa, but, you know, um, but you know, I've seen a lot of um, creative ways that people have used wool for different things. Like uh, just thinking like there's a company out in Utah right now. Um, very, because the thing with, okay, so I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, so unless you have like fine wool, um, your coarse, medium coarse wool is not worth a lot in the marketplace right now. So if you're gonna be wool focused, you kind of have to find that niche, right? So um, there's a company out in Utah right now that is using some of those, you know, like belly wool and coarser wools and they're making wool um, mulch pellets. Um, so basically they're, they chop up the wool and they press it into pellets and they're so selling it um, like as a soil amendment and they just got a contract with Lowe's um, to sell it in their stores. And I think that's a really creative use um, for wool. And, you know, I've seen uh, there's a company in Canada that are making um, like felting wool into uh, pads for like saddles, you know, like a saddle pad. Um, so what I can say is like, there's a use for every type of wool, right? It's just finding that um, niche and market, you know, and um, in the U.S., like I, we need to do a little bit better job, you know, finding those different niches and using all those different types of wool. Um, but just, you know, keep your, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. So just kind of keep your mind open, you know, research what people are doing around you, you know, and hopefully you can find an end use for it. I'm really excited to uh, maybe go check out Lowe's soon and see <laughs> if I can get some of those pellets. That's that's really um, innovative and in just adding nutrients or, or you know, mm -hmm. moisture protection to your soil. So that, I, I really respect um, full use of products such as that. So um, yeah, it's it's basically maybe before you go and decide to buy a flock, you reach out to a few of your community members and, and maybe go meet a few different breeds and see what you like. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's important to do the educational research before diving head on in. Um, yeah. I say that now in my older years. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, um, it's it seems like um, if anybody has any questions, you are open to help them with. Yep. they may need or you know maybe a silly question but um you are very easy to talk to about it so we will we have her information in the chat um on the comments below and i i just want to thank you again kelly for dedicating your time and your knowledge on this really fascinating topic um i've 
I know that my mind is blown. I've learned a lot today about sheep and goats. I might, I might start like a, a goat plan <laughs> now for my dream acreage. Um, but if you know anybody seriously needs needs help or resources, uh, we do have Kelly's contact information, and um, you you can find it below in the comments. Um, I look forward to um, hosting another one of our weekly webinars next week. Um, and we will have more information on that on our Facebook page. So again, this segment has been funded by NRCS and their partnership with the SD Specialty Producers to promote sustainable agricultural practices and environmental stewardship. Um, if you would like to learn more about that, you can go to our website, sdspecialtyproducers.org. Um, right there, we have a lot of information too, upcoming events, other things. Um, we have a directory with lots of local specialty producers and non-specialty producers. So if you're looking for that community of people you need to reach out to, we can help. Um, and I, I hope everybody has a great rest of their week. And I just wanna thank you again, Kelly. Yeah, thank you.